Welcome to this week's program of Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm your co-host Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. Will, you have a very interesting shirt this time. Can you tell us about it? This week's shirt is is my new 50th anniversary DSC Ray, D, DSC Ray shirt. I, I got this after running the 50th anniversary uh, anniversary DSC race. I, I ran the race in Chrissy Field last month. Every Sun, every I run DSC races every Sunday in Chrissy Field, Golden Gate, in Golden Gate Park in Chrissy Field, and on and in one and on one occasion Julius Kahn Park. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Today we have a very special program, Autism and Roles at San Francisco State University, where we have a number of the students, parents, and organizers of the Autism Support Program. We'll now begin with a brief round of introductions. Hello, my name is Lavette Spencer. I work at the Disability Programs and Resource Center at San Francisco State University. I am a disability specialist, and I have worked at San Francisco State University for 28 years. My name is Betty Yu. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Special Education and Communicative Disorders, and I am a friend of the Autism Support Group at San Francisco State. Uh, hey, good afternoon, guys. My name is uh, Mikhail Jameson, and, I'm an, and I am a optimistic freshman at San Francisco State University. Hi, my name is Matthew Unis. I am a SF State alumni, just graduated last month, and a proud member, a proud alumni of the Autism Support Group at SF State. And hi, my name is Isabella Brown. I am a graduate student in the Moderate to Severe Disabilities Program at SF State. I'm a parent of a student on the autism spectrum and a friend of the Autism Support Group and a mentor. Thank you very much, and welcome to you all. Will, would you take it from here? Tell us about the autism about the autism support group and other disability supports and resources at, at San Francisco State. Well, I'd like to begin with the services that the Disability Programs and Resource Center provides. The Disability Programs and Resource Center are available to all students, employees, and visitors with disability at SF State. And I'll just name a, couple, a few of the services that we provide. We provide accessible event planning, access and construction alerts, deaf and hard of hearing services, on-campus shuttle, and also student resources. My role is a disability specialist, and I work with students with disabilities that are registered with our office. I verify disability documentation and determine the services students are eligible to receive. I also, when students first come in, they do an intake service. They do an intake. Um, they can bring documentation in immediately on the spot, and we're, the specialist and I are able to determine the services they are eligible to receive after reviewing their documentation. Some of the services that we provide to our students with disability are priority registration, meaning they will register on the first day of registration, exam and classroom accommodation, textbook and multimedia conversion, accessible technology commons assess, on-campus shuttle service, and also scholarship resource information. And we offer a whole list of services, not only for students, but also employees as well. I'd like to share with you some exciting news about the Autism Support Group. In the fall of 2011, the Disability Programs and Resource Center launched the Autism Support Group. And our whole emphasis is education, career, and social support. Our group meets on a weekly basis from, on Mondays from 12 to 1 in Burke Hall 160, which is located on our beautiful San Francisco State campus. We do an array of events, activities, in addition to providing support. We provide, we do Autism Awareness Week, which is every April. We work with the campus community on sharing the information about autism awareness. We also have provided um, a faculty retreat 
panel, panel discussion to our faculty members, just helping them to become familiar with autism and any questions that they have in, regarding, in regards to working with students on the autism spectrum, and that was a total success. And we also partnered not only with the students, but with faculty members that help and that are friends, and also parents that are friends to our group as well. We have done some amazing, amazing things. We've also presented to a special ed class, 791, which is taught by one of our faculty members, Professor Woodford. Um, we presented to her Nature of Autism class as well. So we do an array of uh, things. We try to get the information out about working with students on the autism spectrum. And I'd like to share with you some of our group statements um, from, from some of our group members. They've expressed their testimonials. The group is a place where they can relax, socialize, and become a little bit more interactive. They feel comfortable being who they are around and in the group, and they can talk about just anything they would like. So basically, we support each other during the group. Um, one of our members said, I see us making a difference for current and future students with autism. The group feels like a family. Um, our successful efforts to spread autism awareness and making connection with the campus community shows what we can accomplish as a group. We have a total of 10 group members. They attend weekly. They are excited. Um, not only do I facilitate, but the group members facilitate as well. It is a group effort. Out of the 10 group members, we had four group members to graduate. We have one group member that graduated with a degree in special education. Um, we have one of our group members who's on the panel. He graduated with a mathematics degree. We have another group member who also graduated with a mathematics degree as well. We have a group member that's studying um, Japanese. Her plan is to go to Japan this summer, and she will teach Japanese as well. I am so excited about our group. I am very, very excited, as you can see. Thank you. It's really great to hear. Now I'd like to ask uh, Matthew and Mikhail, what does the Autism Support Group mean to you? Well, the Autism Support Group uh, was very meaningful to me. It, you know, gave me, you know, like a sense of purpose as of state, maybe it felt like I actually belonged to something that was, you know, meaningful. Um, you know, because I, if it wasn't for the autism support group, I probably would have just felt like another, you know, one of the students on campus. I would have probably felt like I would have easily been lost in the crowd. I think that the support group gave me a place where I could feel comfortable, a place where I can interact with people, you know, that can relate to what I'm experiencing and, you know, you know, exactly the kind of things that I'm going through. And uh, the autism support group, you know, it's been a, you know, a great lifeline of support during my time at SF State, whether it's, you know, the weekly meetings that we have or the, you know, the ongoing, you know, words of encouragement and support that people like Lavette or the co-facilitators of the group provide. So I think that the autism support group is one of the best things that I came across during my time at SF State. Really good. What about you, Mikhail? Oh, well, for the autism support group, I mean, uh, like keyword support, like support means like having a lot of help and having people like to back you up when like you're nervous or like you're down and like coming from me like this is like my first year at SF State so like when I first set foot like on the campus like I was really nervous because I kind of like built like a reputation and got so attached to like life back home in the East Bay in the city known as Richmond that uh, it's kind of different culture and like, I got so attached to my friends, like, it was nice. Graduation came, like, everything was, like, it was, like, beautiful. And then SF State came, which was, like, also beautiful as well. But, like, once I came to San Francisco, it was, like, wow. Like, it's, like, a completely different feel. And my first couple weeks at SF State, like, I was, like, really scared and intimidated. Because, like, transitioning from a school with about 1,500 students to, like, 30,000. It's like a real, uh, 
like it really blew my mind from there and i didn't i was like fairly familiar so like i was like le learning more as i go along and that's when i ran into the the spectrum and the dprc like they informed me on the support group and i decided to give it a shot and ever since then like they've definitely helped me a lot like personally with the academics because schoolwork is always like a wrestling match and also like personally like guiding me around the campus like kind of like being the compass that uh, like in my back pocket it's just like extremely helpful really good and really encouraging will would you like to add from that what do you feel proud of in your experience as a student at, S at sf state that is an interesting question i guess in terms of being proud and happy of something i guess uh real philosophical i guess being at sf state in the first place because sf state is like one of the state universities and universities in california or like across the nation and like the steps to going to college like in general right are always tough because that requires like a lot of hard work before and like i worked hard before like put like blood sweat tears on the line then when i got the acceptance letter from sf state like it just showed that like it was worth it. It's like the reward was so sweet. That and like having ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> like like it, it goes sweet with it, but I guess in terms of when I was at SF State, just trying to adapt, like how a chameleon adapts within his environment. Just trying to find a couple student orgs, joined a couple internships, and from there I met a, like a good amount of students that like are not much different from me, just like, students trying to graduate be successful and some of them want to drive Lamborghinis but. so what I feel most proud of as a, a former student now at SF State is probably being a part of the support group for one is it gave me a sense of identity it made me feel like I actually belong to something much more than just you know a university um, and I probably say also, aside from the fact that, you know, I made it through my education, which certainly was no easy task, you know, being a math major. Um, so getting through that, through the, the grind of the daily, you know, the daily grind that, you know, the math major provides, I think that was uh, quite an accomplishment in itself. But I think also, too, you know, the, the friends that I've made during my time at SF State, because earlier in life, you know, I had like zero confidence and zero, you know, I never really was able to open up socially, you know, at earlier stages in life because of my disability and because nobody else at the time really understood my disability and how I was different from them in so many respects. So I think SF State, one of the things that it's provided besides an education is you know, it's given me the opportunity to open up more socially and it allowed me to, you know, make friends, I think, more easily because of the ongoing support, you know, of the, the support group and, you know, the encouragement of people along the way. You know, I've had great mentors and, you know, I think other various aspects or you know factors allowed me to open up more and be more socially active i think much more so than what i've done in the past so i think sf state provided not only you know an education a degree but also you know gave me a platform to be more socially active and to develop you know friendships that started during my college years and you know hopefully will continue for many years to come what are some things for parents to keep in in mind for to support their children and or prepare their children for higher education? Uh, the, the most important part in preparing kids is making sure that you're getting them out into the community and that you're not um, sheltering them um, because if they're going to college, they really need to be able to navigate through things, um, even if they're not. Uh, um, on being social, just having the ability to um, have had experiences and know what to do if you need to approach a professor or ask other students questions. Um, it makes it a lot easier 
to do if you've had those experiences before. And uh, another really important thing is to remember to um, that even though your, your kid has graduated from high school, that a lot of supports are still needed. Um, if they were once in an environment where they had speech and OT and behavior support therapy and all those things were in place, um, now this transition, um, they can feel like a fish out of water. They no longer have those supports. So the autism support group is um, a really vital aspect, but some students on the spectrum um, may not want to join a group like that. They still may feel that um, they need um, whatever their parents were providing and a lot of kids go home on the on the weekends so parents have to remember that when they do come home you really have to be um, on top of them organization wise because keeping up with your studies and notes and everything that typical college students are always doing um, our kids on the spectrum may have a little bit of trouble with that so um, uh, and, and as a mentor, not only a parent perspective, but as a mentor, I was always talking to my mentees uh, by text message. We were always texting mm -hmm. each other, and I would say, hey, you know, did you study? What are you doing? What's, what are your assignments? Will you meet at the library and talk about what they were studying? And um, <laughs> some of the rituals um, that my mentees would have, like playing video games, that can present a huge problem when you're in college, uh, mm -hmm. self-managing and, and that um, self-discipline stuff. <laughs> um, you tend to wanna stay on uh, your video game, but I, I would have to remind them, parents have to remind um, their kids, you know, study time, put the video game down, and it, it's difficult to do, but um, some students may also face academic failure for the first time because of these behaviors and keeping them on board and, and being a cheerleader is so important in those instances because you want them to remember that you can definitely do it. We might have to change things up a little bit, but you can do it. Excellent. As a parent, uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit more. You mentioned that it's important uh, to keep on the, the students to make sure that they do what needs to be done when they're at home as well as at work. How do you do that? <laughs> well, um, gently um, approaching the situation very gently because now we're talking about adults. They're no longer children, exactly. right? So um, uh, I do lists, um, mm -hmm. creating task lists. So that way I'm not saying, you know, do this, do that, and they're not feeling mm -hmm. like small kids. Um, they're taking responsibility for these tasks that are on the paper, and I'm just checking in. Hey, how's that going? Um, have you made it to step three yet? You know, this is what you have to do next, you know, and reminding mm -hmm. them about your schedule and about how important it is to stay on task. Maybe not at a time where they're feeling um, really anxious and overwhelmed, mm -hmm. but in a different setting when they're open to uh, listening to that information is really key. Do the things at the right time. Yes, absolutely. Excellent. Well, thank you. Will, would you like to continue? Well, I also wanted to go back to an earlier statistic that said like about one out of 68 people overall in the population are on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I understand that San Francisco State has what, 30,000 students more yes. or less? Mm -hmm. So I would think then that at the uh, university itself, there would be hundreds of people on the spectrum who may not know or uh, be part of the organization right now. Do you do any sort of outreach to them and what are your thoughts? Yes, we do. Um, we do have 30 students that are registered with the Disability Programs and Research Center that are on the autism spectrum. Um, we do reach out via email, um, we post flyers all over the campus. Um, we do try our best to reach out to students and sometimes it's be a word of mouth. Um, our alumni students are really great as well. They reach out to students as well. So we're hoping that we can recruit new students in for the summer, for the fall semester since we've had four students that graduated. But we do encourage our alumni students to continue to work with our group 
For example, on Autism Awareness Day, we always have our alumni to come and help us out in getting the word out to the campus community. Um, and I like to stay in touch with our group members to see how they're doing, um, have they found employment, or if there's any additional support that the group can provide them. And one really great thing, they come back as guest speakers as well, and they continue to support our students. So to answer your question, um, the TPRC Office Disability Program and Resource Center, we will be reaching out, as always, to try to recruit more members, additional members to the group. Excellent. What are some things that faculty can do to support students on the autism spectrum in their classroom? I'm glad uh, you asked that. We're really um, reaching out to our faculty to help them understand the needs of uh, students on the autism spectrum better. And increasingly, um, the approach uh, that is preferred is a neurodiversity approach, which means that um, seeing autism and other disabilities as a normal, um, you know, a, a normal presentation of a whole spectrum of, you know, uh, student behaviors and human behaviors, and that um, there are ways of um, organizing the classroom to support a diverse range of learners so that um, as many people as possible can attain their learning goals. Um, there's a concept associated with that which is called uh, Universal Design for Learning, mm. UDL. And universal design for learning means that um, instead of thinking about um, uh, adapting your classroom to one person and their disability, that you, from the get-go, think about all the possible needs that could come into your classroom and try and design your courses to be as accessible as possible from the get-go. Um, one example of that is um, in our society is, for example, we're probably all used to uh, curb cuts on our sidewalk. Um, originally, that was an accessibility uh, accommodation for people who uh, need to get on and off the sidewalk using a wheelchair and other, um, and, and other tools for, for mobility. Um, but how often have you used that curb cut, you know, because maybe you, you're stroller. pushing a, yeah, pushing a stroller, stroller or a shopping cart. <laughs> um, another example of that is um, closed captioning was originally designed for um, people who are hard of hearing or deaf. Um, but the studies show that when you turn on closed captioning for all of the students in your class, everybody gets the mm -hmm. information better, um, you know, because you have uh, some extra text coming in to reinforce what you're hearing. Um, maybe students who don't speak English, that's their first language, mm -hmm. can benefit from that. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the spirit of universal design for learning, is that you think of from the get-go, different ways of presenting um, information and organizing your class to reach as, as many different kinds of learners as possible. Um, I wanted to share four uh, specific um, key tips, I guess, uh, for faculty um, that, that may help them think through some universal design for their, for their classroom. Um, and those uh, four things are uh, think about open communication and consistency. Um, uh, keep in mind that students may process and interpret information differently. Uh, keeping in mind that students may communicate and express themselves differently. And the fourth one is students may respond to the environment differently. Um, and to elaborate very briefly on, on each one, um, open communication consistency for example, being very clear in your syllabus about what you expect over the course of the term, having things in writing, having a schedule that people can follow in advance so that they know what's mm -hmm. coming up, um, and having a, a syllabus and a course website that's organized is very, very helpful. Um, preparing students in advance to participate. So for example, we know that sometimes group work and a, a lot of things that require face-to-face -face, uh, talking, especially spontaneous discussions, may be more challenging. And letting students know ahead that this is coming up next week mm -hmm. um, so that they can start preparing for it can be very helpful. Um, if any issues arise, letting students know in a courteous manner, pulling them aside, asking to see them outside of class time, and uh, just having a uh, discussion to let them know before 
too much time pass and it's hard to do anything ab about it. In terms of helping students who may process and interpret information differently, um, making sure that your directions are clear, your, your questions are easy to interpret, um, presenting information in different ways. So not only speaking the information you need the students to know, but also having it in writing, maybe presenting it in video, um, having different modalities that people can tap into, um, allowing students additional time, um, helping students get the big picture, um, maybe tapping into knowledge that they already have. Um, in terms of helping students who may communicate or express themselves differently, making explicit, uh, explicit what the expected classroom behaviors are. For example, if you're not supposed to have your cell phone out or if you know eating is um, a, a problem in the classroom, you need to make that very clear. Um, and uh, also, in the same way that you present information in many different modalities, also allowing students to share what they know through different means. So, you know, if you're testing for a concept, can they write a paper or do an oral presentation and have their choice of uh, what works best for them? Um, and lastly, um, for students who may respond to the environment uh, differently, uh, thinking about what makes a comfortable learning environment um, and within reasonable uh, limits making accommodations for example um, making a scent you know a scent free environment mm -hmm. or, or, you know a, a environment that that minimizes artificial scents or uh, keeping the lights dim or using natural light um, and really hearing from your students what makes a comfortable environment for them uh, maybe pro providing some breaks for people to um, take, uh, you know, to regulate their, you know, you know you regulate their senses and, um, and take sensory mm -hmm. breaks. Um, and um, we have some uh, references of, um, you know, books that are meant for uh, mm -hmm. faculty and also students to think about how to uh, support students uh, on the faculty side or for students to self-advocate for what they need in the classroom. And uh, I can send ahead those um, references for you to post for the viewers. That was my next question. Where can we find these things, both parents, students, and the interested folks like me? Yeah, well, we will send ahead some resources you could follow up on, and um, it's a really exciting time. More and more individuals on the autism spectrum are, um, you know, uh, getting to college in greater mm -hmm. numbers and um, being successful in the higher education setting. So I think this is a discussion we'll hear more and more. Excellent. This has been really fascinating. I know that we have had a very long-term and rich relationship between Ascend and uh, the group at San Francisco State, both the Autism Studies Group and the Autistic Support Group, and we look forward to having you on again. And one last thing, how can either parents or students who may be in the area or beyond, and possibly educators who'd like to replicate what uh, San Francisco State and you have done, how can they contact you? My contact information at the Disability Programs and Resource Center at San Francisco State University, we are located in the Student Services Building, Room 110. It's on the first floor. My direct phone number is 415-338-3452. That's 415-338-3452. My email address is Labatt, that's L-A-V-E-T-T-E-B, at sfsu.edu. Again, Labette, L-A-V-E-T-T-E, B as in boy, at sfsu.edu. I would love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. And we thank all of you, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thanks. Well, for this week's show, I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burnick. I'm Labette Spencer. I'm Betty Yu. I'm Michael Jameson. I'm Matthew Ennis. Stacey Kennedy. Isabella Brown. Have a great week until we see you again. Mm -hmm.